Welcome to Chats with the Chief. I'm John Jensen, Chief of Staff at the Veterans Health Administration, and this is the podcast where we make small talk about the largest integrated healthcare system in the country. This week, I'm joined by Dr. Rory Cooper of the Human Engineering Research Laboratory. We'll talk about how a tragic accident led him to his life's work developing assistive technology for veterans. Enjoy the show. Well, Dr. Roy Cooper, thank you so much for joining us on Chats with the Chief. Uh, It's great to be here in your lab and see exactly what you do. And so maybe before we get started, you can introduce yourself, a little bit about yourself and your family and kind of what you do. Great. Um, Well, thank you for having me on your show, John. It's a pleasure. Uh, I'm Rory Cooper. Uh, I guess to start, I'm uh, an Army veteran. Um, Got my education uh, through the VA and uh, um, essentially never let me go. Uh, I'm originally from California, but I've uh, lived in Pittsburgh uh, for uh, um, nearly 30 years now. And uh, I'm uh, married by uh, my uh, girlfriend from Germany when I was in the Army. We met when I was a young E4. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we'll celebrate our 40th wedding wow, anniversary next year, which is pretty exciting. Um, I'm an engineer by training. Um, Started out as an electrical engineer and moved on to become a biomedical engineer. And now I'm a senior career scientist in the VA and run um, four large research programs for the VA, or, which are all housed under the Human Engineering Research Laboratories, which is a joint effort of the Department of Veterans Affairs and the University of Pittsburgh. At the University of Pittsburgh, I'm the FISA and Paralyzed Veterans of America Distinguished Professor. Fantastic. And so, and I'm also the assistant uh, chancellor for, um, um, assistant vice chancellor for research. Um, we run a pretty big, a pretty good sized team here. It varies between 70 and 100 people, wow. depending on the time of the year and how many interns and students we have with us. And our focus is on creating uh, technology that, that doesn't exist, that uh, improves the lives of our veterans and by extension, Americans with disabilities. And of course, if uh, we can help uh, help people across the globe with disabilities, that's that's yeah. an extra benefit. Yeah, I think it's something that not a lot of people know is the amount of research that happens in the VA and how that contributes to the rest of society, not not just caring for veterans where we should be, but also really to whole society. So. Yeah, I think so. For me, what's really exciting about working um, in academia and in, in the VA is I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm, Started my uh, my professional life in the military, and I'm very mission driven. Right. And the VA has you know a, a wonderful mission, and having access to students and attracting them to <laughs> right. to believe in that as well and support our veterans, I think is makes it tremendously exciting, and um, and frankly, just to me, I just veterans are great to work with. Yeah. They you know yeah. I, it's hard not to admire people that you know were young and healthy by and large, and and, and made tremendous sacrifices yep. uh, for our country. And if we can, whatever we can do to help them out, uh, you know, I'm 100 percent on board. Agree. Well, again, thanks for being here, and uh, we look forward to telling your story, telling the story about the hurl and all the great things that are coming out of here. One of the things we like to do is really to get the audience kind of uh, acquainted with you. Uh, and all of our guests. And so we kind of start with some very simple questions, but really it's interesting. I always get a lot out of these real questions. So the first question is, uh, what book or TV show are you watching today? What book is on your nightstand next to your bed that you're reading right now? Um, so the book that's on my nightstand right now that I'm reading is the um, Story of Courage. That's the book about the uh, founding of the, the Paralyzed Veterans of America and the, oh, wow. uh, and, the uh, and also at this are uh, simultaneously the founding of uh, wheelchair basketball and uh, it's pretty exciting if you think um, I guess I didn't tell the listeners that I myself have a spinal cord injury and, and that I uh, occurred while well in the service and but uh, um, the uh, uh, those the amazing you know that there that was the first generation that really lived and uh, and if you said the Long Beach VA the Bronx VA mm-hmm. other uh, uh, the Heinz VA in Chicago they, um, you know, the, the, their story of that, they realize that um, they want to go home, right? Yeah. And they want to participate in life. And right. They started playing wheelchair basketball and started putting um, pressure on the VA and on their, um, on their military medical commanders. A lot of people don't. At that time, actually, there were usually officer, medical officers in the VA as well because many of them were still 
on active duty oh, right. or hadn't yet been retired to become veterans. And um, you know, it's pretty, pretty amazing story. And uh, and look at the impact they've had over 75 years later. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, 75 years as well as the BHA anniversaries this year as well. Yeah. That's great. Um, so another uh, question I always like like to ask, and I, and I know having been in your office that, that you have a lot of hobbies that you do, <laughs> that you excel at. Uh, but what is something that you would say, you know, this is my hobby, and maybe it's not something that no one else would think of? Um, well, I think every, my, my, my favorite hobby is, that, uh, is hand cycling, right? And, and that's what I, I love to do. Um, probably one that I also collect uh, commemorative U.S. commemorative stamps. So that's oh, really? That people don't, probably don't know too much about me. Interesting. So how many do you have? I have uh, all of them uh, from 1900 on forward, uh, at least except for the, you know, the odd ones where like the, um, the biplane's upside down or something okay. like that. Yeah. But all the you know, ones that went into normal circulation. And I haven't, uh, I'll probably wait till I retire when I start <laughs> looking at the uh, ones that get a little older than that. Yeah. They, uh, they're a little harder to find. Sure. Oh, that's really interesting. I've never met anyone that's collected those, so that's pretty cool and really interesting. Um, something that, w that I always like to share with is a, a lesson or piece of advice that you've ever received that's really stuck with you or that you continually give to others, because I know you really have a great following of people that really admire all the great work that you do. So is there a lesson or piece of advice that you either give or have received that you kind of hold on to? Um. Yeah, I, a couple. Uh, when I was uh, in the NZO Basic Academy, I, I learned a lesson, I think, that stuck with me. Uh, uh, two real lessons, really, that stuck with me forever. Um, one of them is that if you take care of your people, they'll take care of, your, mm -hmm. they'll take care of you. And I think that's something I always believed in. Um, and then, of course, the other, uh, you know, it's in, the, it's in the Army Creed, right? And that's the thought of selfless service and um, being part of something that's greater than yourself. Yep. And I think that's, um, it's one of the reasons that I, you know, I, I'm very proud to be in public service. Yeah. Yeah, and continuing that service from your time in the military, but it's, uh, it's great to be around others that are dedicated to the same thing. It really helps a lot. And so it leads me into my question that you mentioned that you were, uh, you're a veteran and what, what led you into service to start with? What kind of what led you down that path of service? Uh, that's a great question. So I um, probably uh, started, well, my father was in the Army, um, and uh, well, one of my grandfathers was actually in the Merchant Marines in World War II. Okay. Uh, his claim to fame was he was there for the sinking of the Grass Fay. Oh, wow. Um, my, um, that, and I was in, in the Boy Scouts and uh, influenced through a lot of our World War II and uh, Korean and Vietnam veterans mm -hmm. who were provided the leadership. Uh, for when I was in the Boy Scout, I rose to the rank of Eagle Scout. And um, so I, you know, what I thought about was, what, when you graduate from high school, what do you do? Um, I came from a small town and we didn't have a lot of money. And um, I thought, you know, serving my country would be a good way right. um, to, uh, eventually get an education, maybe find a career, um, get a chance to see a little bit of the world, right. and, uh, and do some good. And um, I, think, I think all of those things came true, even despite coming home in a wheelchair. Right. I still um, did wind up getting an education. I found a calling, and I found a wife. So <laughs> you know, all in all, I think it was positive. Yeah. Uh, so what did you do when you were in the military? So I started out as a unit armorer, okay, and uh, doing small weapons repair. I, my first assignment was with the uh, Third Ordnance Battalion, which is part of 32nd Air Defense Artillery. Well, at that time it was Air Defense Artillery Command. Now it's Air Defense Artillery and Missile Command. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I did that for a while, and then, um, as was the tradition at that time, I was. A new program of civil affairs was being started up okay. in Europe, and um, um, my uh, battalion commander called me in my office one day and said, um, you're going to be uh, going off to school. 
<laughs> learning a new, new task. And uh, uh, so I wound up doing civil affairs, um, which I, uh, I enjoyed tremendously, actually. Yeah. So uh, where were you stationed at in Germany? And then, then how did that, uh, and then, you know, you know your life changed completely when you're in Germany. So maybe you could describe a little bit about that time that you were there. Sure. Well, the funny thing is uh, I served in two units and on the same base. Okay. <laughs> I um, went to uh, Worms, Germany, which is in the rhineland palatinate area, um, and not too far from Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, uh, that's where I was with the 3rd Ordnance Battalion, uh, which we were a, um, we had missiles at the time, was what our responsibility for. Um, and um, then I, when I went to civil affairs school, which I did in Germany, which oh, wow. one of the few people, I came right back to Worms and to work for um, Fifth Signal Command and 21st Support Command, um, which was great. Uh, and um, of course, civil affairs, I, German was the language I developed, so I had, of course, a German language identifier, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, which has done well because one, it allowed me to talk to my wife, <laughs> right. but also uh, my, you know, right. now, mother-in-law and father-in-law and you know her brothers and sisters yeah. and all the nieces and nephews and and a funny story that a lot of people don't my uh, we traded my my mother's sister my aunt uh, now lives in germany she oh, wound wow. up marrying a german man and and uh, moved over there wow amazing amazing and, and uh, so your life changed while you were you were stationed in germany do you would you care to describe a little bit about what happened and how, what kind of led you to this obviously life-changing event. Yeah, so one of the things is I was a good runner in the Army and I, I ran on the uh, U.S. Army Europe track and cross-country team. And um, I was, uh, I had some problems with my knees and I was just getting back into doing uh, PT, so I rode my bicycle quite a bit. And um, let's see, uh, July 23rd, 1980, I was on my bicycle, um, gonna ride with my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, she had about a 10 kilometer bicycle ride to work. I had a few problems with her bicycle, so I got a little bit behind her. So her brother and I started after afterwards. And unfortunately, I got uh, side swiped by a bus and then hit head on by a, um, one of those uh, Mercedes trucks. Mm. And um, um, I, uh, I lay on the street and then I, uh, I, just, I knew at that point I, I, um, I couldn't walk, I couldn't get up. And um, I passed out, and then an ambulance came and picked me up. And um, they asked me in the ambulance in German, they, they, they treiben zu viel Sport, which means, do you do a lot of sports or exercise? And I said, yes. And that was probably because my blood pressure was pretty low, my heart rate was low. Um, they took me to the first hospital, and they really couldn't do anything for mm -hmm. me. And they uh, were at least um, smart enough to send me to a level one trauma center. Um, uh, short uh, short distance away uh, in Ogersheim, Germany, which is the BASF mm -hmm. uh, um, accident clinic, well, our own fight clinic. And um, I got wonderful treatment from a, a German doctor there, uh, Dr. Ungemach, and um, he was able to revive me, basically stayed in the emergency room or the intensive care unit with me for about three days. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, then I, you know, then I spent about six weeks in intensive care, and then was the army came and picked me up. And the medical evacuation helicopter took me to Frankfurt Army Hospital, mm -hmm. and went to Walter Reed for well, went to Andrews at the Walter Reed on one of those beautiful Bluebird buses for a little <laughs> while, um, and then uh, um, eventually got shipped shipped home, and then did my rehab in the Sepulveda VA. Wow. And so you, you know, kind of been associated with the VA ever since then, obviously. But, uh, and, and now that led to today where you're an award-winning scientist and researcher, uh, you have your doctorate, uh, and you received awards, just two, two awards this, this year that, that I know of from uh, the IEEE as well as Pennsylvania National Guard. And so, so how did that kind of change from, you know, recovering in uh, Sepulveda to, to leading you to running this fantastic institution? Um, well, I think, uh, I would say one of the things is the, uh, 
Uh, I really got great care when I was there. Uh, I got introduced to the National Veterans Wheelchair Games and the Paralyzed Veterans of America and, um, you know, uh, the, my physician there, Dr. Nikas, was also very supportive. And even when I was in intensive care, my, my commanding general, General McKnight, and even the commanding general of US, U.S. Army Europe, uh, General Herb Croson, came to visit me wow. in the hospital. Both con encouraged me to continue to go to college and that I could still make a big difference in yeah. people's lives. And so that, you know, that was all in my, in my mind. Um, and when I went to Cal Poly, the, uh, the professors were really great there. And I was, you know, a lot of times undergraduates you kind of get randomly assigned an advisor. Um, mm -hmm. Some people you have interactions with, some people you have less so. Uh, mine happened to be a guy named Dr. Saul Goldberg, and he was great. And he, um, he worked with me and said, let's, let's, uh, this, or, you know, how to accommodate the curriculum and that let's make, that's really an engineering problem. So let's yeah. get to participate in everything you can participate in. Um, so you can get the, you know, we can get the best education you can get here. And uh, that was great. And the fact that the VA worked, worked with me as well, um, going to the veterans wheelchair games and getting good wheelchairs and, um, you know, having the resources to go to college, I think was, um, yeah. And then um, I decided to get out. I graduated, worked for a while, Pacific Gas and Electric, doing uh, a double Canyon nuclear power plant. And um, I got exposed to teaching there a little bit by mm -hmm. helping to teach some of the, uh, the um, apprentices. And um, did my master's degree while working part-time, or while working, and then um, decided to go on for a PhD. When I was there, I, then I, um, I had a great advisor as well, uh, Stephen Horvath, and um, he, um, he introduced me to the field of rehab engineering, biomedical engineering, and, uh, and he said, you know, you can take your kind of your hobby and actually make a, a career out of it and, and make a real difference in people's lives. And then he kind of said, and if you don't do it, who else should do it? <laughs> That's right. That's uh, which right. Uh, uh, really made me think about yeah. it. And, um, and I was offered a postdoc in the VA, uh, in the Heinz VA in Chicago, where I worked with uh, John Trimble and Charlie Robinson, and they were uh, very supportive. Uh, funny thing was I couldn't find a place to live. Uh, so I, um, they, uh, they worked, they said, well, you know, you're a veteran, you get your care in the VA, so why don't we uh, check you in? And I lived in the uh, transitional unit for the blind <laughs> rehab unit. Really? In, in Heinz? In Heinz. Okay. Uh, which was pretty interesting. I wound up being not only uh, doing a postdoc there, but also, um, but also being sort of a peer mentor for young injured <laughs> yeah, spot sure. and, 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 and blind and veterans as well, as because uh, you know I'd been out and living for a while. And I was also working at Cal State University of Sacramento, so I was kind of commuting, oh, wow. um, flying back and forth to try to do both. But uh, that gave me my introduction to VA research, and, and I've never left. <laughs> and, and here we are sitting in the Hurl Lab, the Human Engineering Research Lab. And uh, so maybe you can describe a little bit what the Hurl is and what, what is it that you and your, your team do here? Uh, that, thanks. Uh, so the, the idea for the Human Engineering Research Labs actually came out when I was in graduate school. I, I looked and I said, you know, everybody's working in silos. And um, I'm, I was used to, from the Army and then my exposure to the VA, people working in teams, mm -hmm. uh, multidisciplinary teams. And so when the opportunity arose to come to Pittsburgh and work for the University of Pittsburgh and the VA, uh, I thought, this is our, my opportunity to yeah. create something where we work in teams, where we have engineers and therapists and physicians and business people, lawyers all working together. And you want, you want students because you want to introduce them to the field, but um, you know, all the way to senior scientists. Mm -hmm. And um, I want, really what I wanted to do was have a place where you had the resources and the human resources, the space, the equipment to um, solve uh, complex and challenging problems facing our veterans. And um, started with myself and two graduate students and uh, we just built it up now to where we're 75 to 100 people depending on what time of the year mm -hmm. you're here. 
and um, we have solved some pretty challenging problems, and um, and we're we're continuing to tackle some now. Yeah. So we were lucky enough, or I was lucky enough, to be able to uh, get a tour of the facility today, and to really see the the great amount of care that's put into each and everything that's being done from your team, um, and so. Maybe you can describe a little bit about what kind of items or what kind of things that you do and develop here. I mean, we see some of the stuff behind us today, but how does that development kind of begin and then go through the process of that? So the good thing about our work is our um, ideas stem from the problems facing our VA clinicians and our veterans. And so we, we survey them, we do focus groups with them, and uh, we, you know, that. That, so there, because uh, there's there are far more problems than we can actually. Sure. And we have to, a lot of really of our part of them is sort of triaging them and finding out where can we make a difference, um, in you know how can we have a make the most positive impact, um, which might be a huge impact on a single veteran or right. a smaller impact on a larger number of veterans. Sort of look at both cases, uh, and. Um, then we, um, you know, we put teams together to solve those those problems, and we worked on things from, well, you know, a, a, a anti-tamper device for oxygen concentrators or prosthetic quick mouths, which are fairly low cost and fairly simple, and the development process isn't so long, all the way uh, to like you see behind me some of the um, our robots for assisting with transfer or people that have to use their arms for for eating or. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, picking up a book or or driving over uneven terrain and to help reduce the number of accidents. So, um, and uh, and and athletics, of course, you know, we have sure. uh, veterans in the Paralympics that we've helped, as well as you know, being healthy, right? Aging, healthy aging with a disability is, I think, you know, help me help keep me alive. Yeah, uh, and, and a number of our veterans as well. Yeah, and, and so uh, you mentioned that about veterans and, and maybe the athletic part of it, but also regaining mobility or gaining mobility. What does that? I mean, what does that mean to a veteran? I mean, that's got to mean so much to be, regain some mobility and some really control. Yeah, I, I mean, what people want to do is they want to gain remote mobility, uh, uh, you know, autonomy and some yeah. and spontaneity and some yeah. and self direction in life, right? And that could be. Um, you know that everybody has to have sort of their own personal definition of what that means to them, but um, you, you want to you know large like now we're currently working a lot uh, not only on wheelchairs but on driving and we've been, you know, done a lot of robotics as well. But as we move into accessible and it, how do we make autonomous vehicles accessible? How do we make vehicles a better uh, and transportation systems for that matter? Mm -hmm. So because um, it means. It's your ability to work, participate in family, participate in um, civic affairs, you know, all of those things. Uh, in, our, in many cases, for our most severely wounded and injured and ill veterans, that requires uh, technology. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, so you mentioned technology. So what's kind of on, what's on the horizon of the future as it advances and the technology has seemed to really are running downhill today? What kind of, the, what things do you see on the, on the future that's what we're on the cusp of today? So um, I see uh, robotics, autonomous systems, um, and, uh, and, and data science is kind of the, the future for us. You know, can we know why, if people are using the technology and how much and how and how yeah. much benefit, can we use that technology like machine learning and in some form of AI to help uh, veterans participate more in their own health care? So you know, reduce pressure injuries or um, other other conditions that may come about, or just look about optimizing care. Mm -hmm. um, I th uh, so I think there are a lot of uh, tremendous of opportunities. I, you mentioned a couple of things about uh, how the impact is on the veterans, and so you so when when you're working with a veteran or, or a physician or somebody that's concerned about something that they're trying to make work, how, how does that communication work with, with you? Or, or you, you have you know, groups that you're finding out what concerns they have, but if you're like, let's try this device and there's a, you know, what is the process that goes into all that kind of trial part of things? 
Well, we use a process that we call participatory action design and engineering, where we engage veterans throughout the entire process, from conceptualization all the way to okay. critical impl implementation. Um, we have veterans on our staff. We have people with disabilities on our staff. We have people with various uh, clinical backgrounds mm -hmm. as well as engineering backgrounds on our team. And then we have partners throughout the VA and throughout the veteran service organizations community as well. And so that really is, is kind of the driving factor. When we, um, when we do a whole variety of things from, from focus groups to the, um, you know, journey mapping or life mapping to um, large scale surveys um, to database mining. Um, as well as engagement in, in studies in our lab, engagement in studies at events, engagement in studies in the community. Uh, we, uh, would, we want veterans engaged in all of our research mm -hmm. in every aspect of it. So if a veteran is maybe watching this, how, how could they get involved in something that they want to be a part of? Uh, that's a great question. So the veterans can get involved by um, contacting our stakeholder engagement team. Uh, uh, through our um, website or through our, our LinkedIn page or our Facebook page. Um, we have a, uh, a Twitter account mm -hmm. and um, uh, they can look on our webpage and see what studies are ongoing. Oh, but wow. people can also just um, contact with ideas they have as well. And they can also talk to their local VA and just explain, talk to their clinician and say, I've heard about this. I saw this uh, podcast, and uh, I'd like to become involved in research. And they might have opportunities locally, or they can right. connect to us as well. Great. Well, we've come to the end of our time, but I did want to give you an opportunity to share any other additional thoughts that you might have, and uh, t and to really th thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you. Oh, thank you. I I'm thankful for the opportunity to be on your podcast and share our message. And um, you know, I just like to say that. And, you know, the other thing is that uh, veterans, you know, get engaged with the VA, not only for your health care, but, you know, as a job opportunity or yeah. to volunteer for research or, or volunteer just to, to help patients in, in our VA. Um, you know, we're, we're on the same team. We are. Yeah, you know, one third of our employees are veterans, and so care, veterans caring for veterans, and you know, veteran leading, you know, amazing place like this, but it's really to benefit additional veterans. And so, on behalf of other veterans, thank you for what you do every single day to care for veterans, and uh, thank you so much for sharing the hurl with us, your story with us, and uh, thanks for whatever happens in the future. We look forward to more. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for, for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. A huge thank you to all of you for listening, to Dr. Cooper for his time, and our broadcast production team for their support. See you next time.